Perfect. Hi, everybody. Welcome back, those of you that were just in the last session. Um, this session is on posture, and I will be starting out with a little bit of background, and then Dr. Holly Wise will be talking about a lot of the therapy interventions and what you can do. It's very related to the previous talk we did on spine, but a little bit different perspective. And we will have time for questions at the end. I think we allowed a little more time for this session. So when we talk about posture, posture is actually both a noun and a verb. The noun is it reference to the way in which your body is positioned, whether you're sitting or standing, your posture is the position you are in. As a verb, though, it's to assume a posture, especially to strike a particular pose for effect. And those of you that saw us taking pictures over there, we were doing some pretty unusual postures. We were posturing for our picture. Ideal standing posture is alignment of the everything in, in symmetry. So the head looking forward the ear centered over the shoulder, the shoulders open and relaxed, arms relaxed at the side, the torso balanced over the hips or pelvic girdle, the knees just slightly bent, feet shoulder width apart, and the weight even through both lower extremities and through the arch of the feet. Now I could bet that probably every one of you in this room that had polio cannot maintain an ideal standing posture because the minute you start having some asymmetries and muscle weakness, something is going to shift. Our posture is determined by a number of factors. One is the skeletal anatomy. And although ba everybody basically has the same skeleton, there are variants and there are congenital conditions that cause increased curvatures or there can be asymmetries. In fact, most people are not perfectly symmetrical. You know, one of the things that determines beauty is how symmetric the face is. And so people that are considered very beautiful usually have a very symmetrical proportioned face. But obviously, not all of us are great beauties and not all of us have perfectly symmetrical bodies. Posture is also determined by muscle function and the strength and flexibility of the muscles as well as the connective tissue. It's affected by joint function. If a joint is limited in its range of motion, if because of soft tissue tightening or because of injury or degeneration, a joint does not, is not able to maintain its full motion, that can impact your posture or body alignment. Weight distribution will also affect posture, genetics, as well as your habits, or if you have pain somewhere, you will tend to shift away from that pain or into a position that alleviates pain and affects your posture. So when we look at the skeletal alignment, the spine is really that center of the posture, but is affected by the position of the pelvis, whether the pelvis is tilted or rotated, the length of the lower extremities, and the joints in the lower extremities. So if there's a problem with one hip or one knee, an ankle, that will affect posture. Uh, and a little bit of joint deformity or joint rotation will pull the entire leg into a different position, tilt the pelvis, affect the spine, and affect posture. The muscles that contribute to posture it's important that they have strength as well as flexibility. They also have to work in a coordinated manner. Sometimes when you have muscles weaker than others, certain ones start to fatigue faster than others, your movement becomes less coordinated and it's not a smooth movement or symmetrical movement anymore. In addition, muscles help to maintain balance and again, that's that equal force in different planes. You can, as we talked about previously, with different spinal curvatures that can result as a, an effect of polio, when you have a curvature in the spine, so the spine does not have its normal um, alignment, the muscles 
are put under different stresses and it's harder to maintain that good posture. The connective tissue also serves as an anchoring force that is both strong and restricts certain motions, but does provide a degree of flexibility and keeps joints stable and functioning in the planes they are meant to move. Our normal spinal curvatures is the cervical spine has a little bit of an inward or forward curve, that's cervical lordosis. The thoracic spine, a little bit of an outward or backward curve, that's our normal thoracic kyphosis. And then the lumbar spine, again, a little bit of lordosis or inward curve. And the skeleton here is showing you sort of what's considered the norm. There's a little bit of a range of what's considered normal, but there's also um, times where those curves are out of the range. And you can, by looking at that alignment, realize that if the thoracic spine develops increased kyphosis, that's automatically going to cause a compensation in the cervical and lumbar spine to maintain balance so that those curves also increase. So when we look at asymmetry of curves, they can either be primary or secondary. So um, a scoliosis might be a primary lateral curve in the thoracic spine because of weakness, but then a secondary curve may develop in the lumbar spine to compensate. Same thing with the thoracic kyphosis I mentioned. If you develop kyphosis because of weak muscles or genetic conditions, you are going to develop a secondary increased lumbar lordosis and cervical lordosis. Sometimes these curves are fixed, meaning they're not very flexible. It's related to the way the bones grew, and so there's not much you can do to change it. Sometimes they're more flexible, more related to soft tissue imbalance, and can be straightened at least to a partial extent. In general, the body tries to balance itself so that these curves are often balanced and the head ends up centered over the pelvis, but there's times that it can't be balanced and the head is off to one side or forward or back, and um, those usually cause more problems. Spinal curvatures, abnormal curvatures may or may not cause symptoms. It does not always cause pain and often people will have abnormal curves for many years and not have any problems with it. Lower extremity asymmetry and that if you had polio affecting one of your lower limbs, you all are very familiar with, can cause a difference in the leg length. That in turn causes a tilt or rotation of the pelvis, which not only pulls the spine out of the straight alignment, but also puts different stresses on the joints so that you may end up being putting 90% of your weight on one limb or um, you're putting your hip joint may be in a position that's adducted rather than a straight position and you're putting stresses through areas of the joint that aren't really designed for that. The asymmetry of the pelvis, obviously polio is um, or of the lower extremities is, is a common cause, but also injuries to, so fractures, injuries to joints um, can cause leg length differences and skeletal asymmetry. Um, degeneration, sometimes a joint degenerates faster than another as it's losing its cartilage, it may become uh, compacted and shorten that limb. Sometimes it's surgeries for joint replacement. Um, joint replacement surgeons try to equal leg length when they do a joint replacement because they have a little play in where they can put that prosthetic component. But sometimes they don't get it right and it can cause a leg to be longer or shorter after the surgical procedure. Muscle imbalance, again something most of you are quite familiar with, is really uneven support or poor support to those skeletal structures and really affect body mechanics. Once our bodies are designed that the most efficient motion occurs when we're in alignment and symmetrical. 
once things are shifted into different planes, the muscles aren't as effective biomechanically. They have to work harder to do certain motions. And there's changes in the joint position. If the changes occur early, so those of you who had polio when you were young, those altered mechanics and uneven support also influences the way bones grow. So bones can develop with asymmetry or rotation and different things that contribute to that asymmetry because growth of bones is dependent on the stressors to the bone tissue. In addition, as you're moving things out of alignment, you may be putting more tension on certain ligaments and tendons. Over time, those will stretch and that asymmetry may get worse. This is common in patients or people who use back bending of the knee to stabilize the leg. So if you have a weak quadriceps and rely on locking your knee back, if you don't have a very strong hamstring muscle and are relying on those ligaments at the back of the knee to support that, those stretch over time. And you may notice that as you get older, that knee is going further and further back before it really locks. So weight imbalance also affects posture. And I was nice here and used the <clears throat> pregnancy example, but obviously as the abdomen grows for whatever reason, <laughs> it adds weight to the front of you which then, to keep your center of gravity over your feet, you have to increase the lordosis in the lumbar spine to maintain that balance. And so um, this is where gaining weight, even if it's not a significant amount, can really affect balance and body mechanics. So in a polio survivor, there are postural factors that we can't change. Those are due to genetics. Those are due to the way your skeletons formed as you grew. The muscle weakness related to polio that we can't undo or make those muscles come back. The ability of joints to function. And some of the body mechanics are fixed where what works for you works for you and there's no other way to do it. But that's not always the case. You'll see that joint function and body mechanics is also on the other side because there's a lot of the things, the way we move joints, the way we move through space that can be modified. And Holly's gonna talk more about that. So the things we can modify are weight. Well, that could be debatable in some cases, but it is at least partially modifiable. Um, some degree of muscle strength. Again, you have muscle weakness due to polio, but you, it's likely you also have some muscles that are just deconditioned that could get stronger. Muscle flexibility is something that can change and improve, as well as flexibility of connective tissue or strength of connective tissue. Those all impact joint function. Joint function can also be modified by using braces or external support to put them in a better functional position to maintain better posture and alignment. Habits have a big impact on posture and you can all imagine the teenager that likes to sit in front of the television like this guy on the slide, you know, they all seem to come in and just slump down like they don't have a bone in their body. And a lot of us get into bad habits as far as how we sit or how we work at a desk or computer. That's a pretty common one as well. We're okay, we're not seen as good anymore as we get older and all of a sudden we've got our heads way forward and are putting ourselves into postures that can cause problems and cause pain when we maintain those abnormal positions. So what's good posture? Well, good posture puts the bones and joints in correct alignment so that the muscles are working the most efficiently. When you are in 
a good position. It decreases the abnormal wearing of joint surfaces that can result in arthritis. It decreases the stress on the ligaments holding the joints and spine in position. It can prevent the spine from becoming fixed in an abnormal position. So we talked about um, the kind of the fixed and modifiable things in posture, but sometimes what starts out as a modifiable posture, as you get older and there's degeneration and uh, deformities of, or bone spurs and those sorts of things, those abnormal postures can become fixed even though they were modifiable early on. Good posture reduces the fatigue of the postural muscles because when we maintain good posture, those muscles don't have to work as hard. So it actually takes less energy to maintain good posture. There's less strain and overuse problems, less back pain and muscle pain, and you look better. <laughs> it's funny, I mean, I laugh because <clears throat> But every time you start talking about posture, people always like to sit up straighter and, and, and hold their heads up. But if you're walking down the street and you watch people walk, people that carry themselves with good posture and very upright, they present a much different image than your person shuffling along like this, right? And it's probably why we always yell at our kids, stand up straight, you know, pay attention to posture. But you look more confident and well when you're maintaining good posture. So posture though is certainly a challenge for somebody with polio who has asymmetries. And our goal is not perfect posture or the ballerina poses, <laughs> but to try to improve your posture to the most efficient and comfortable positioning that you can maintain. So Holly is going to talk about some of the techniques to achieve that. Okay, I'll get your show started. No, what happened? That's it? Look at your fancy. Wow. That's so funny. I just used a PowerPoint template and got a nice surprise. Hi, I'm Holly Wise. I'm a physical therapist, and I've been working with people with a prior diagnosis of polio for the last 30 years. Started as a physical therapist in private practice, some of my patients came to me in the 80s and were having these problems and wanted, asked me if I knew anything. No, but I will try and learn. So then I went to some continuing ed courses. Despite the entry level education that I had in physical therapy, they didn't teach us about polio back then in the 70s when I was in school for physical therapy. So what I learned, I learned from all the different individuals that I've worked with over the last 30 years from continuing to look at the literature and to see what's out there, which is still pretty scant, and problem solving with colleagues because each person is individual. So this presentation that I made up for you today was really a starting point of our conversation. It's a general presentation. It probably doesn't apply every single slide to you because the uniqueness of each coexisting diagnosis like spinal stenosis or osteoarthritis or fibromyalgia changes the recommendations. So th these are just general recommendations about posture, and then we can individualize them to each of you. But the goals are the same. In fact, now if you look at how a physical therapist would manage working with someone who has acute polio now at 2014, because you know it's still happening around the world, it's not eradicated yet, our approach would be to help the individual maintain the best alignment throughout their life course 
and not allow them to walk with obvious gait deformities, which then lead to overuse and breakdown in osteoarthritis. So the approach of rehab, as you've been hearing in some of the different conversations, is actually a little bit different than what everybody in this room went through. So the goal really is to have the best, most efficient posture that still allows you to function efficiently. And if it means using the braces, assistive devices, and technology, then for health and wellness, you need to supplement with the right kind of physical activity to ma maintain that strength and flexibility that you want. So with that, I'll move on to the first slide. But I, I really want this to be more of a conversation. I'll actually take questions in the middle of my presentation, if it helps. Um, and before I get started, I sort of want to know how many spouses or partners of people who've had polio are in the room, or children? So it's like 40% are people who don't have a prior diagnosis of polio, and everybody else is, is that correct? Everybody else in the room has had polio. Then there's somebody, ah, other healthcare professionals or people interested in working with individuals with polio and lead support groups. Great, okay, good. All right, so as Carol Vandenacker so eloquently explained, as Kat and Cynthia did too, that posturing is not just static. It's also movement. So when we talk about posture, we have to talk about standing, if that's possible, sitting, which is what we're doing a large portion of the day, so we're gonna spend a lot of time on sitting posture, but also when you're, your body mechanics, when you're bending over, lifting something up, but also when you're sleeping or lying down or taking a nap. So we'll look at postures in those different positions today. And some of the reason why it's so important to have an up, uh, the best posture attainable in all those positions is that there's less interdiscal pressures on your back when you're in the ideal resting posture of a spine. And so this is a very, very old slide where, of a study that looked at interdiscal pressures in the low back. And it showed that when you're standing, we'll use that as the baseline of 100% balanced um, or weight bearing, that when you lie down, it reduces the stress because the gravity going through the spine is reduced. And that supine and side lying are, are much less interdiscal pressure than standing upright sitting actually increases that interdiscal pressure. So if you look to the right, and I don't know if this little pointer works, does it? There it is. That when you sit, it's actually higher interdiscal pressure than when you stand. And when you slump, and there we go, we're starting to get a little kyphosis and forward head, there's actually more pressure on the spine helping to explain why as we slump, we can actually have more back pain than we're sit if we're sitting in a more balanced position. Again, this is very individualized. There's some postures that can't be fixed, but you could change the position. So reclining may help reduce back pain in those individuals that may not be able to sit upright more in, in, on their own, unassisted. So overall, in general, the goal for healthcare professionals looking at people with polio is to, now I, isn't that wild? Didn't know that one was gonna move either. That's a very <laughs> exciting. I better double check my presentations more. So it's just showing how changing your foot alignment changes every, all the way up the chain. So that when you're standing posture, if you happen to have pronated feet where you fall, fall in on the inside, it can actually put you out of alignment all the way up to your head and neck. So that you have to look at the whole body, the whole individual. I just don't focus in on someone's feet. I have to look at their knees, I have to look at their hips, I have to look at their spine as well as their head and neck and shoulders. And the balance of muscle strength and the flexibility all impact this picture. So the goal overall is to have the best alignment, be it standing, be it sitting. We're gonna talk a lot more about sitting because I think that's what the majority of the individuals in this room talk about. So let's get to the questions that were coming up about head and neck pain, which is very common for people that sit for long periods of time. 
And this is a great illustration that doesn't move. I know that because it's an old, old slide. But as your head starts going forward as you're sitting, the biomechanics are such that it increases the load on the spine more, 10 pounds more, 10 pounds more. So you can see why it becomes more and more tiresome and hard for your neck muscles to stabilize as you start slumping. So again, the ideal is to come upright with the head and neck in a neutral alignment. And so why does that sitting posture increase that low back load as well. We know about the head and neck coming forward, but let's go back and revisit that low back pressure. Because when your knees and hips flex up, if you look at, and that's your pelvis right there, it actually flattens out when you're in a seated position, if there's no support behind it. That actually, the example, and I think it was Kat or Cynthia, who talked about a little towel roll sometimes in the small of your back, or how many of you ever put your hand behind your back if you're sitting for a long period of time? You're trying to create your natural lordosis that balances your spine. So a lot of times we instinctively try and go into the postures that are more balanced for our body and more efficient and cause less pain. So I was hoping this one did move because I didn't think it did, but now I keep getting surprised. But this is just an example of how the interconnectedness of the spine. So how I'm balanced at my pelvis, if I'm uneven with a muscle mass difference due to weak gluteus maximus muscles so that I don't have as much bulk in them, I might be sitting off. It changes all the way up to the head and neck. That, the base, your foundation when you're sitting, may be the cause of your neck pain. So it's all related, and you have to look at all the different pieces together, which is why a team approach is really helpful with polio evaluations, because no one person always sees everything at once. Sometimes it takes a conversation to figure it out and put the pieces together. Driving, driving long distances, especially if that's your primary mode of travel or vacationing. It's very important to look at your seating posture when you're going in the car long distances. And so thankfully, most of the new cars out on the market have individualized seating assessments. It's wonderful. When I get really upset when somebody changes my little preset selected seat by accident, because then I gotta get back into my nice place and figure it out and set that seat. I also love the warming function, but I'm from South Carolina, and in the winter, I will turn on my heater, and it feels great on the low back. But a good seating and getting it set at the foundation in the low back affects all the way up to the neck. So you have to look at posture in the car, posture here, posture at the computer. I like this picture because it talks about the importance of looking at the ergonomics of of how where your computer screen is affects the head position. So you want your computer screen, and I have a huge monitor on my computer that I set on large font so that I can see it without my reading glasses on. I have it set at eye level because I want my head to remain in neutral. I don't want it up or prolonged down. I want it in the most neutral alignment for my spine armrests that support your arms. Sitting without arm rest is a big weight on your head and neck. And that if your arms are supported, they unweight those muscles. And this, a lot of times, is a big problem for people in scooters whose armrests aren't high enough to help unweight their head and neck, um, unweight their shoulders and, and the weight of them. How many of you have, ah, I saw somebody in here who carries with them a little step stool. It's a collapsible, adjustable step stool that they, it's plastic, fits in their purse, and probably they're not in here right now, but when you sit for long periods of time, it's important that your feet are balanced, knees apart on the floor for stability, but if they're hanging down off your chair and not quite touching the floor, you need to bring the floor up with a step stool or a slanted rest so that it helps unweight the rest of your spine. Because if, as you hang, if your feet are hanging down, not touching the floor, you tip forward and it changes the posture all the way up. 
So you have to look at all these different positions, including listening to a very long posture talk, which I kind of laugh because here we are in this room from 9 to 12 with only one break. It's kind of hard. That's not the best ergonomics. We should put in it breaks every 15 minutes that everybody kind of moves around. So you're supposed to be aware and change right now, and it won't hurt my feelings if you need to get up, move around, go out, and stretch. <clears throat> All right. So let's look at some sleeping postures. I think everybody has heard it three times in the last two days from Dr. DeMeo as well. I think Cynthia mentioned as well, I love a body pillow for pe to help people attain the best posture when they're sleeping. Because especially in a semi-sideline position, you can put the pillow between your knees but like Dr. DeMeo talked about for sacroiliac problems, which is very common in women especially, you can also put it between your ankles. This picture doesn't have it between your ankles, but if you can fit the pillow between your knees and your ankles, it keeps the alignment of your legs in neutral. I was trying to show and still talk into that mic, but in neutral because otherwise you swing your leg up and over and it's going to torque your back while you're sleeping at night. So the purpose is to attain the most neutral alignment that promotes the best comfortable position for you to sleep in. How many of you have awakened with increased neck pain since you've been at this hotel? Because we're with different pillows and we don't have our little neutral alignment. And that's why many people travel with their own pillows just to help um, promote that. Even though they give you four different pillows, I couldn't find one I really liked. But <laughs> um, So getting a good comfortable sleeping posture. And the nice thing about that real long body pillow is that it does support your upper arm as well. So there are different posturing for when you're on your side. So not everybody stays in one position all night. Who moves when they sleep? So there's no way are you expected, it's unrealistic to think you're going to keep in a good posture all night long, but it, you want to set yourself up to at least fall asleep in a nice neutral posture when you wake up, if you have to get up and go to the bathroom or use a urinal or bedside commode, then you readjust and you get back in the posture. So the whole goal of attaining neutral alignment is to have optimum efficiency. When you have optimum efficiency in alignment, you have less pain, less fatigue. You feel better and you look better. So there are a lot of physical benefits, psychological benefits, and when you're more rested, you think better, and cognitive benefits for having good alignment. But to attain it, sometimes it takes, like I keep saying, we need brainstorming among healthcare professionals. It takes you collaborating with healthcare professionals, too and talking about what works for you, what doesn't work for you. So it has to be individualized. No one recommendation fits everybody in this room. It has to be very individualized, and all of us have talked about the importance of getting a thorough um, health history, uh, understanding what your goals are for physical therapy or for a polio evaluation clinic, and trying to match that with what's realistic and achievable considering cost effectiveness as well. So it's very individualized. It includes a complete muscle test in various positions, a, um, assessment of your posture, measurement of your extremities, because many times leg length discrepancies are often overlooked and can be contributing, or, and it means taking your socks and your shoes off. So if you ever go in and you're not rolling up your pant legs or taking your socks and shoes off, there's a lot of information that your healthcare professional is missing. Sometimes we have to see and watch to understand. Then coming up with recommendations that we feel may help you attain the most neutral posture to help reduce pain or fatigue um, and improve your well-being. Now, the first presentation covered a lot of the modalities and the interventions that physical therapists often use to help prepare you for exercise. So I'm not going to repeat those, and I'm not going to repeat specific exercises as well. I'm going to really concentrate more on um, assistive devices and a seating assessment. But ex exercise, if it's appropriate, is put in here because it's really dependent on your muscle test grades on 
if exercise could be contributing to your postural alignment issues. And I'm going to have a couple examples of prior clients on just how we solve their seating issues or their postural issues over time, but just to talk a little bit about, many times we do recommend corsets if the core muscles are not intact for the individual with polio. And that's one of the few times that we do recommend some external support and it can make a huge difference. I had one gentleman who really had full muscle strength in all four extremities. It was his trunk that was affected. And consequently, now that he was reti retired, he was playing a lot more golf. And it was, ha it was really increasing his pain when he swung the golf club. Well, number one, anybody in here a golfer? It's one of the most biomechanically incorrect sports there ever was. And I can only say that because I've taken golf lessons because I wanted to appreciate what my husband loves so much about that game. But the whole time I kept playing, I kept going, this is just not a healthy activity for your spine. It really, and if you look, that's why all the pro golfers have had disc surgeries, knee surgeries, et cetera, because it does put a lot of torque on your spine. That being said, if someone chooses it for their sport and their recreation, I'm going to help them do it. It's their choice. So the reason he was having so much pain is he didn't have the core stability to do the golf swing well. So we got him a lumbar corset. He was able to return to golf with less pain. It helped maintain a better postural alignment with the corset than without it. So exercise, if, it, if it's appropriate, and many times it is. There's an imbalance of muscles. Many times the core is the one that people aren't addressing, and if you can strengthen it, it helps set the whole chain up and down for better alignment. Assistive devices and seating assessment. So a lot of what we do in physical therapy and in polio evaluation clinics with medicine is problem solving. I like... Um, Doc, we all went out to dinner. We've, we've been longtime friends for 20 years, and we all started in Miami, Florida at a polio evaluation clinic. I ended up moving away. Uh, Dr. Vandenacker moved to California. Kat Wallum has moved to the Wallums are in Waldo. <laughs> Where's Waldo? Florida, right? That's what I said. Poor, she, she's heard that a million times, and Cynthia's still there. But we all problem solve together with you. The individual is part of the problem solving. You have to participate and take ownership, especially if you would like to adhere to the recommendations. If we give you what we think helps and it, you're not interested in it, this is a waste of time. So it has to be a mutually collaborative relationship and not one-way communication. So problem solving. So I'm going to ask you, looking at this individual, why do you think he's having, and if you look, this is the upper trapezius muscle, and the levator, that's the levator scapuli, but also the upper trapezius would come further along. Why is he having increased pain when he walks long distances? Yes, Maureen, in the center. That's a good idea. Did you have a different idea? So we have two people think kink kang's too long. Anybody else? What now? The position he's holding it, and it's a standard C cane handle, which in general I actually like a J candle hang. Ergonomically, they look like the letter J because you don't have. It, they just take the weight more directly down it. But there are a lot of biomechanical reasons. Um, why that if he were to try, and you can just do it as a trial, it's not harmful, shorten the cane, get an adjustable cane, shorten it, take a pain measurement log, what's his pain level throughout a week with his old cane, do a week with a new cane, see if there's any impact on pain levels, and if there is, you make a decision to change the height of the cane. So through trial and error, you can come up to solutions. So here we have another individual. This is how she was walking. She, who do you, why, why do you think this individual, and she gave permission, all, all of my pictures, everyone's given permission to let me use them. Why would Cheryl um, 
come to me with, and her physician that I was seeing her with, come to, me, come to us with significant back pain, significant fatigue, and she worked full time. She was a legal assistant, had to carry a lot of things. Well, we gave her a cane to help reduce it, but this is how she looked. The picture on the left-hand side, she wasn't using any assistive device at all. She had a very short limb and, every, and weak hip abductors, and every time she stood on that leg, she sheared over that side of her body, and that's where she was having some significant issues as well as the other side of her body where the disc was protruding. So, we gave her an assistive device that gave her more upright alignment when she walked. Was she very thrilled to use an assistive device? No. no. Did she use it 100% of the time? No. Did it help her when she did use it and when she had some flare-ups of discomfort? Yes. So it's a choice. She also chooses not to wear her braces. She has, has bilateral AFOs. She doesn't like wearing her braces too often as well. Um, so Marmaduke would like her to come out, I'm sure, to uh, California and be evaluated, but she just, she's in retirement now and she's happy um, managing it symptomatically, but the goal in this particular case is to maintain the best posture and the best alignment to help reduce those complaints of fatigue, pain, and new weakness from inefficient activity. A lot of people that are in the seated position full time or need to use a wheelchair for mobility may not have the best seating alignment in their wheelchair or their scooter. And that can contribute to pain, to pain and fatigue. So a, a referral to an appropriate professional can help improve seating alignment. I do not do seating assessments. It takes advanced training by the individual who goes to that. And I refer my, my clients and my patients to another physical therapist who's gotten her assistive um, technology. It's ATP certification where she'll individually measure. I, I send her my evaluation. She'll replicate what she needs to and adjust the seating. So if you look <clears throat> on the left, this particular wheelchair does not put someone in the upright posture that Dr. Vandernacker's slides were showing, trying to attain a more upright, balanced, sitting posture. <clears throat> so now I'm going to introduce you to another patient that I have followed over the, maybe 12 years or so. Yes, sir. I have some general opinions on them, yes. I think if someone is ambulatory and able to get out of the scooter, change positions frequently, and it works, and they are happy with their scooter and they don't have pain, that's fine. But if you're, if you're seat, seated, seated, if you're sitting most of the day, and it's very difficult for you to get up and ambulate, you need to move out of that scooter and have a better sitting posture, because it's very difficult to attain a good sitting posture in a scooter. Especially if you're driving a lot in the forward head postures, a lot of people have increased neck pain from the scooter, which is Pixie. And we're gonna talk about, this is Pixie. Pixie, this is her family. <clears throat> this is probably mm, 30 years ago when she was out enjoying time with her family on, um, on a boat. And if you look, you can look at her legs and see she's got some atrophy and some very important muscles even at that point. So her quads are, appear to be not fully developed and muscular. And you may think, well, that's, she's just a long-legged dancer. And she just may not. But you could, knowing her history that she had polio, and also I can also tell just by looking at the picture, she's got some core stability issues going on because her abdominals, and she's a very slim lady, are protruding in this picture. So this lets me know when she sent me, I asked her to send me pictures so we could just document her journey over time, that she had some obvious weakness early on but was happily managing them 
until I met her probably 15 years ago. We just happened to sit next to each other at a conference. One of her best friends was a physical therapist. They were having a conference at, in Kiowa, which is a really nice resort in South Carolina. So she went along for fun. And we just happened to sit next to each other. And she, she was talking about physical therapy. She said, what kind of patients do you see? I said, well, you know, I, I have a really sort of a niche practice. I only work with people who have a prior diagnosis of polio. And she went, I've had a diagnosis of polio, and, and I'm having a lot of problems. Can, you know, can we talk about it? Did a muscle test evaluation. There was a very obvious re reason she was having such significant pain and weakness. And so through problem solving, and this is her 30 years later, still looking great. <clears throat> and actually, I, I don't think you can tell in the picture, but she's standing up with the use of long leg braces in this picture before I met her. So when I saw her, she was pulling herself upstairs. She had two long leg braces, and she was falling. And so she needed to have some assistive devices to improve. So when I first met her in 2000, I guess the year was 2000, 2001, her goal was to reduce the frequency of her falls. She was falling monthly. Does that bother you at all? How about once a year? Does once a year bother you? It should, especially if it happens every year. And especially if you have a history of osteopenia or osteoporosis, falling can be a very dangerous situation. So yes, we want to reduce falls. She also had excessive fatigue. I usually use a measurement tool to assess fatigue levels, and I use that just to track changes over time. Because sometimes the difference in someone's individual fatigue scores will document if a recommendation I make is effective. So we did her fatigue scores, they were off the chart. She had also wanted to reduce her pain. She was having significant pain, but she wanted to stray, stay as strong as she possibly could. <clears throat> so at that time, we had recommended an AFO on the one leg that she wasn't using a brace, to start using crutches, to start using a scooter for long distances, because she wasn't using any kind of long distance assistant. And with that, we started talking about getting a van to help carry the scooter with her. In general, I don't recommend that people have an external lift to their car that they get their scooter on and off of. I don't know how you all feel about it, but I get very concerned. If someone needs a scooter for long distance and they're at a risk for falls, they're using a scooter for safety, then on a rainy day, or if they're by themselves, standing very precariously and trying to get your scooter off a back lift is a dangerous activity to have to be doing. So I prefer to, to have a much safer approach um, if you're going to a scooter or, a, well, of course, with a power chair. And then we actually stopped her from walking for, fit, for fitness and recommended that she be in a more stable position and do seated um, fitness program, a seated. It's hard, you have to sit there and creatively, based on your muscle tests, figure out the best approach for each individual. So here's, here's Pixie again in her scooter, and she burned out two engines in her scooters because she took them everywhere. She went to the, where are the sands of, aren't there the sands in New Mexico? They're beautiful, beautiful, big sand hill. She goes everywhere. She goes on every outdoor trail she can find. And she started having grandchildren, and she loved it because she could go to zoos, take travel with them, and just having a blast. She and her husband did get a, a van, and they could transport the scooter, and they just continued on their journey. She is in a red hat club, having fun with her girlfriends. And in this picture is the actual physical therapist that I met with her, gosh, 14 years ago now. She came back for a, another follow-up evaluation. She was starting to have some pain. She was having a lot of neck and upper back pain, still, and her fatigue had resumed, but she still wanted to stay strong. She had been very adherent to her exercise program, working with a personal trainer at a fitness facility that I would communicate either by email or on phone, and we would discuss all the activities that she was doing. I would put my recommendations, share them with the fitness instructor, who we're still in touch with today. And she was having massage, which was very helpful. Um, we actually at that time recommended she get a seating assessment and move to a power chair. 
She was having a lot of swelling in her legs because of no active muscle contraction sitting so much. She was having a lot of swelling. So we needed to elevate her legs and the scooter wouldn't allow her to do that. And with that, you get a headrest so that when you do recline, <laughs> that you're not hanging backwards, that your head's supported as well. To get a headset for her phone, another recommendation that you all met, and to continue with her seated program, but it was modified. So here's Pixie again, still traveling, went to Alaska recently and in her power chair, still enjoying the best quality of life and trying to maintain the best postural alignment that'll manage the most of the symptoms that she has with a prior diagnosis of polio. <clears throat> I saw her again, and now she, it was just reduced fatigue, improved function, stay strong. She wasn't able to participate in her kitchen as much, so instead of a bathroom redesign, she found an architect to work with her. She redesigned her kitchen to bring everything down to wheelchair height, could roll right up, and she's now those same grandchildren, or this is a ne another new grandchild, she's able, she brought uh, countertops down where she can roll underneath and continue with a lot of the baking and the kitchen activities that she in enjoys. So she's still rocking this hat and still going strong and, and it's, a, it's, it's problem solving and just trying to little by little continue to embrace technology so that she can live life to the fullest. So always being aware and open to new ideas new AFOs, old AFOs, new canes, old canes. I see a lot of people with the three-pronged cane, I mean the three suction cup tip here. Um, and that's how you can try and promote upright posture to help reduce a lot of your symptoms. So that wasn't very much conversation. That was a lot of two-way conversation. So I think now we can open it up to questions. We have three minutes. <laughs> Oh, no, we have 18 minutes, good. So, any questions? Yes, do you want to come up here? Yeah. Um, what are you recommending for a way to get a, a scooter in and out of a van or, or a SUV or whatever? Are you saying you should just have somebody else do it and not you do it? But then that actually, that actually limits your independence if you depend on someone else to help you. The ideal situation, and gosh, not everybody can do an ideal situation. It, there's so many variables. But in general, I recommend a side entry van that has the ability to lower with an electric ramp. You roll right it up into it and you lock it down. You've got to have a safety mechanism to lock that scooter down because if you're ever in an accident, it becomes a body weapon. I like that. <laughs> a weapon of mass destruction inside your car. Um, so that's the ideal situation. Plus you can just take out that middle row but people still sit in the back and if you're in a scooter I'm assuming you're still ambulatory then you can get up and drive from the driver's side. What about? How do you feel? Oh, do you have a difference? I don't ever want to be a one-sided person here. <laughs> I think, I think Holly's describing the ideal. I think the reality is a lot of times people can't afford the totally modified van. And depending on where you're at with the degree of weakness and how well you're ambulating short distances, a lot of times the lift on the back of a car um, is adequate at least for a period of time but as people get weaker you have to start realizing that then those transfers in and out of the scooter or into a vehicle can get more precarious okay good yes any other questions or sure Here, maybe I can go first. We're good, we're good. Anyway, I just wanted to share um, something that I'm actually doing in, in uh, the clinic for postural feedback is um, because one of the things is repetition for learning. And we may all know how to attain a good posture, but it's keeping it there and learning how to do it over time. So I've been using kinesio tape. Mm -hmm. I like kinesio and, tape as well. And having a person get into the proper posture 
applying the tape, like say between the shoulder blades, and then when they start to slouch, they feel a little tension against the tape and it offers a little biofeedback. Whoops, let's get back up into the right position so that you know you get that feedback through the day and it can stay on. And you strengthen. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you're stretching the pecs and you're strengthening the back and it, it tends to work and you know, I've been using it for years, but now that the tape has gotten better, it used to be I would use whatever tape I had, and, and you had to be very careful for skin irritation, but things have come along, and, and it's, it's one effective means. And kinesio taping, you can buy at Walgreens. Yeah, right. I know. My whole tennis team buys it. <laughs> Over here. K-I-N-E-S-I-O. Okay. <laughs> Do you see the wealth of experience in this room? That's good. I just learned it. Learned something. Okay. Yeah. So the question was if you wanted to improve your posture and kind of figure out what was ideal for you, what was the best approach, would it be to go to a physical therapist? And I would say yes, um, that um, in general a physical therapist is the one that will um, best be able to help you look at your alignment and figure out what's going to work best for you. Sometimes when it comes to the seating systems, we use occupational therapists. A lot of them are mm -hmm. trained mm -hmm. in those as well, or if it's more upper extremity involvement that you have, an occupational therapist might be the person you're working with. Absolutely. Maureen. So Maureen's question is about um, Medicare and seating. And yes, if there are medical justifications, Medicare will cover specific seating. Problem being, Medicare will only cover a new wheelchair every so many years, mm -hmm. and it's five years. Mm -hmm. So if there's a change in between, if there, again, if there's a medical justification for, and, and often the seating can be done as inserts into the seat of the chair, it's not a whole new chair. So often we can get that. Um, sometimes it's harder and we have to just plan for when you get the next chair. Um, and I think it's, it's wise before you get a new wheelchair or scooter or anything, maybe talk to your therapist or physician about components you might want on that chair because if you go to a wheelchair center and they just sell you their newest model, it may not be ideal for you, but once you've purchased that and Medicare has covered it, you're stuck with it for five years. I have two comments, on, and, and just to add to the conversation, in a good seating clinic, usually the vendors come in, and in conjunction with the occupational therapist or the physical therapist, they try different seating assessments with you. And many times they'll let you try out some of the technology before it's a permanent purchase. The other comment that I wanted to make was on what, oh, regarding to, to get a postural analysis, it's really important that you work with somebody that is familiar with polio so that they have a realistic view. And probably the best way to do that is to go to the PHI website and look at the support groups in your state as a reference point, to, as a contact for somebody locally. And if there isn't one, you could, you could certainly go to um, the next adjacent state to see if they have any recommendations. That's very true because I certainly have had some of my patients go, go to physical therapists who thought they could straighten their spine or do some things that were fixed um, postural asymmetries. So in general, you will want somebody that has a knowledge of polio. If you have leg problems? So the question is, if you have leg problems, should you use one cane, two canes, or a walker? 
and I can't answer that with a lot, without a lot more information on which muscles are how strong and watch you walk. So it could be any of the above. In general, if you're having breakdown in one arm because you've been using a cane, it's because you're overusing that arm to walk. And in general, if you disperse it over two arms, it's going to be less stressful. So again, it goes back to, is it a totally non-functional extremity that's with a long leg brace? Well, then in general, um, as, as you age with decreased balance reactions, two is better than one. And, and sometimes oftentimes it takes a while using to two crutches keeps you more upright and more what we would consider good posture. But there are people who need to keep their center of gravity forward because otherwise the legs are going to buckle in which case a walker might be the better solution. Or if they need to stop and rest frequently, the walker with the fold down seat will work better than crutches. So it's mm -hmm. very individualized. And I do know from talking to somebody here at this conference that has spinal stenosis, you know, today we talk about how the upright posture is the best. Well, that'll actually aggravate somebody with stenosis if they're in a flare up and a little forward lean relieves it and then unweighting through, the, unweighting through the arms on a walker actually helps improve their tolerance of upright activity so they're still able to function independently with less pain. But if that walker obstructs their ability to go forward because for whatever reason maybe their legs swing out and they keep hitting the walker, they may go back and use the loft strands. In that case, two helps unload the spine a little bit better than one. Yes, in that particular case, yes. Pardon me? Loft strand? A loft strand crutch? Those are the Canadian crutches that many of you remember. That's a lost it's, strand. It's forearm. a type of forearm crutch. There's actually different types. Walk, yeah. Um, loft strand is one of them. Walk um, Easy is a company that makes right. them. There's Sister Kenny crutches. Yeah. There's all kinds of variations, but it's a forearm crutch. Yes. Anybody else? All right. Up. Oh, one more. Oh. So the question is, is there a roster of therapists knowledgeable about polio? There are some therapists included on the PHI website under medical professionals. So the ones that are active on a more national level um, or very interested in polio are often on that list, like Holly, Cynthia, and Kat. As far as locally, um, as Holly mentioned, Usually the support groups will keep a list of local providers that at least have some experience with polio or are open to discussion and listening to patients. So if there is nobody in your area but there is a support group, asking the support group leader um, you know, what the experience of the group has been can be very helpful. You know, another resource is to actually try um, to look at where the universities are in your state that um, train physical therapy students. I know that at the Medical University of South Carolina, we actually have polio clinics every year where the local support group comes out and I'll have 16 volunteers in the morning and 16 volunteers in the afternoon and the students get to practice their muscle testing skills and their postural analysis skills. but and. So then they go out and they help with polio survivors in the area and in the state. But if you were to contact your uh, universities in your state where physical therapy is offered, they may be able to put you in touch with someone who deals with this population. Not yeah. all the PT no. schools, though, do teach that. polio. Yeah. And an alternative, if you can't find somebody who has polio knowledge, would be to contact your local muscular dystrophy mm -hmm. MDA clinic 
because therapists that work with patients with other neuromuscular diseases will have a basic understanding of what's involved and will be the best type of therapist to go to if you can't find someone specific to polio. That's Francine? Right, yeah. So what Francine is saying, for those of you who couldn't hear, is she has a card that she's given to her medical providers saying if you come across other polio survivors that are interested in you know, speaking and to others and sharing information, have them call me. So your medical providers can't give you names of people they see, but they can give your information away if you give them permission. And certainly through the orthotists as well, um, I always get a number of referral through local orthotists who come across somebody with polio. Oh, did you know there's a polio clinic? And those are good ways of networking. The question was regarding um, some elbow bursitis and overuse of the arms and with transfers and activities. And so I think one of the first things I would look at just from talking to you is, and I would also muscle test your lower extremity strength, why you're using your arms so much. And I, I'm imagining that there's some spotty weaknesses on both sides. Um, and that would be my educated guess if you're going to have that much bursitis, it's usually both legs are involved. So then it would be evaluating the, the height of the chair that you're sitting in to help reduce the impact of some of the transfers, the height of, of all the activities throughout the day, and looking at them to try and minimize as, as many unnecessary transfers as possible. And that's by going through your day and even looking at, you know, the car, et cetera. Um, a comment on your question. As physical therapists, I, I know that I do it. I know that Kat and Holly also. When you see a therapist, um, if they don't have a lot of knowledge about polio, but they, they're interested, I've often had therapists contact me with for basic guidelines, for basic information, mm -hmm. and I'm very willing to share. And so if you have a therapist and you go to a therapist and that you tell them that and you ask them to contact a therapist who has a lot of knowledge and they say they're interested, you found a good therapist. Mm -hmm. If they say, no, I know everything that you need, you know, I know everything about A, B, or C and they're not interested and they, you're having difficulty and it's not being resolved, then maybe you need to find someone who is interested in getting more information. Taking articles, um, we email Super. articles over to other therapists, we'll give them information. Oh, absolutely. And that's how we got started. So just think you'll be contributing to the population pool. Of, that's Cynthia Henley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's go in the back. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. 
No, I didn't. When I was in Florida, Dr. Vandernacker and I would have regular um, polio clinic evaluation days. When I moved to South Carolina, although I originally started with a physiatrist, because of the way her practice grew and I was full-time teaching, we actually had to separate and we do like contiguous type evaluations on the same day if somebody comes in from out of town. And now we just, we see them that way but coordinate visits for out of towners. Okay, one more. Do we ever put people in corsets? Yes, I, yes. I think that was mentioned several times, mm -hmm. both um, by Holly and earlier, that if the trunk muscles are weak from polio and they can't be strengthened, then often the external supports, such as corsets, are very helpful because you need that core stability for effective movement Function. of the limbs. Well, of course, so, so the, the comment was that for some polio pa um, survivors, they, they use their trunk for ambulation or movement, and there are times we can't use corsets or bracing, or we use a more flexible type that gives some support but still allows motion. But, you know, back to what we said from the beginning, everybody is different, everybody is unique, and you have to weigh the different factors and what is the benefit, what is the, the, the downside. And sometimes it might be something you'll use for certain activities, but not all the time. Um, I think we're out of we town. We are, can we take the, the last two, out one, two? Time. Yeah, out of town. <laughs> Find a PT. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's checking the APTA website and specifically clicking on find a PT and looking for a physical therapist that has NCS. It's a, a neurologic certified specialist in physical therapy as a good place to start. In addition to contacting rehab centers in your state would be. And our last question. Depends what kind of corset you're talking about. Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> there still is somebody? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know of anybody anymore. The last person I knew was in Michigan, but retired. Um, there are there may still be a couple people across the country, which you'd have to ask the other polio survivors. Do you know of one? I know of one in Houston. Okay, so there's one in Houston. Um, All right. It, it's very rare that you ha find somebody who can make the old style polio corset. corset. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.